Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, welcome. It's uh, been quite a, uh, another, another year. Now, doing Sydney Hobart's is good. It sort of allows me to remember risk and return constantly as only die in Bass Strait. Anyway, um, look, I really wanted to, I guess, a bit like last year, chat, just chat from a, a couple of, of perspectives. Um, uh, yeah, look, I, I chair the Australian Government's Financial Literacy Board, which um, uh, gets me spending a lot of time with Greg Medcraft, who's obviously head of ASIC, and, uh, and Peter Kell, the deputy chair. And uh, Greg and myself spent a lot of time discussing the, the, the role of consumer protection um, in a sense of what do you regulate and, and where does education, I mean, what, what is the right protection mix? We're all fully aware you can't regulate everything. I mean, for heaven's sake, how do you regulate internet scams coming out of Nigeria and so on? There's clearly some areas where education is, is vital. I really still feel that in the Australian population, and we're some of the best in the world, by the way, uh, on any, any global survey. There are now 93 countries uh, involved in financial literacy and we do all sorts of focus groups. Australia's actually pretty good. But we, st we still find it, it, it fascinating that, it, that the ability to differentiate risk is very difficult um, and it probably is for your mum and dad and maybe your brother and maybe your sister and, and maybe for your best mate who's a, you know, basically financially dysfunctional, like, such that, like, like a specialist doctor for example. Specialist doctors pop up in all of the rip-off scams. Um, my dad was a specialist doctor, I get it. Um, very, very intelligent man, but just, just wasn't really in all, attuned to all sorts of medical risk, uh, but not money risk, which we find really interesting. So basically, it is one of the challenges that we have in many parts of the world because the complexity has just grown just, just so much as we are all aware. So for me, it's both as a market observer, a market participant, and also my role in, in government. I've actually chaired this for the six prime ministers now, uh, and there is no argument between Labor and Liberal, uh, or the Greens or anyone else, that we need to upskill uh, Australians and bluntly the global population and that's why we now have financial literacy in the schooling system, Our kids are now learning money skills from kindergarten, it's not separate subject matter, that's nonsensical, it's built into math, uh, it's built into science, risk is everywhere uh, and you need to teach kids and it's globally accepted now that if you send kids out of the schooling system without a reasonable framework around money and risk when money's becoming invisible, we really are losing the plot. So for me, there's a number of, uh, number of areas, and, uh, but I, I guess as a participant, I'm, I'm chairman of InvestSmart, the um, uh, listed fintech. We own Eureka, an intelligent investor, and so on. And so I'm really fascinated um, about this wonderful change we're all part of, and I see it as evolution, not a revolution, as I said last year. And I'm really fascinated by this, this process of change. I started a company called IPAC 34 years ago. I'm still on the board there. Uh, it's now owned by, uh, I sold it with my three partners to AXA, and then AXA got absorbed by AMP, so it's part of AMP. But I, I, I watch with fascination as I go back to 34 years, and in a sense, nothing really has changed a whole lot. There's a lot of longer words, but the one thing that really has changed, and this is due to the efforts of many people in this room, it'll keep changing, is the cost structure for the consumer has changed dramatically. And, and I'm hugely applauding of that, I think it's fantastic. And I'm quite curious about InvestSmart to see if, in a sense, we can do what I was able to do at IPAC 34 years ago when we started Australia's first fee-for-service advice business. Uh, I'll be fascinated to see if we can eventually end up using a range of tools that we're all using around algorithms and artificial intelligence and all sorts of stuff. It'll be really interesting if we can do the same thing in an honest and ethical way for con consumers, but we can do it at 10% of the price. Now, that would be a real win for consumers. That would be absolutely fantastic. And many of you, of course, are part of, that, uh, part of that evolution. But what I said last year was that, look, whenever I see rapid evolution, and I'm about three times as old as anyone else in this room, um, I gave a note of caution. And what I said last year is, look, where you see rapid evolution, and we need to, you will see failure. Uh, I'm very aware of the failures that have occurred globally in this space in the last year. But I'm not in the least despondent. It is simply normal. Humans aren't very good with this stuff. We, we know in all of uh, my backgrounds in, in behavioural uh, economics, I chair at Macquarie University um, uh, in, in the Department of Economics, and behavioural really fascinates me. I'm really interested uh, in people. And, uh, you know, we watch with great interest that, you know, when it comes to change, people won't believe it. And so the fact we saw the Wright brothers, you know, praying their aeroplane or their stick and string so many times, no great surprise to me. So let me give you my very short version of my 34 years in history and, and the reason I was able to make a couple of comments last year that, that have shown to be correct. 
I sort of accidentally, when I left university, more or less accidentally, I thought I was applying for, um, and I, I was applying for an investment research job. Uh, but when I started on the first day, I was asked to research managed funds, unit trusts. I didn't know what one was. And in 1979, not many people did. And so I found myself as a managed fund researcher for a few years until I started my own business. And um, I started researching these, you know, very strange beasts. And it, it, it is a world you need to think about for a moment. 1979, uh, no ATMs, no credit cards, uh, bank card uh, first. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm telling a fib there. There was an Amex or a Diners. Uh, uni students pulling beers in a pub weren't likely to get one. Um, bank card, 1980 was the first, as you know, really mass consumer card. No Macquarie Bank, no ASIC, no mobile phones. Uh, you needed to go to the stock exchange and get a letter of appointment to see a share broker. As a result, 3% of Australians owned a share. Now, this is not 1832. You know, this is only 1979. It was quite extraordinary. And certainly something that helped Australians with their budgeting. And if you want to find budgeting skills, it's generally in, in, in older Australians. Um, the reason for that is that... Uh, uh, if you didn't get to the bank by 3 o'clock when they shut, you didn't have any money on the weekend. And because you couldn't use an ATM because they didn't exist, um, and you didn't have a credit card because they didn't exist for real people until the year after, you got in no trouble with money at all. You know, basically 10 o'clock at night, Saturday night at the pub, the place is hopping, the band's hopping, uh, wonderful evening, you run out of money, what'd you do? Yeah, you went home. Yeah, great money-saving concept. Doesn't seem to work for my adult kids, they seem to stay. Uh, still don't have any money, but they seem to stay, which is fascinating. So basically, you see these really, you know, quite extraordinary changes. Uh, Vicky and myself, we've been married 34 odd years. We uh, went for a loan some 32 odd years ago and uh, we were a bit depressed when uh, the bank told us to bugger off. And the reason the bank told us to bugger off was that I was then starting a business, so my income stream was not that secure, and I'm respectful of that. I think that's a good call on the bank's part. My wife was a school teacher, and the reason she was a school teacher is that we're a risk, we're a risk managing family. I wasn't going to start a business uh, until we were confident in our relationship and Vicky was confident in me. So Vicky said, look, I'll work for an extra three years as a teacher, if get the business going, and then we can start to talk about children and so on. But the bank manager said to Vicky, and I said, oh, come on, look, you know, we've got a reasonable deposit. And he said, ah, oh, yes, but you've started a business, you're an entrepreneur. You know, bugger off, you prick. And, um, and my wife said, well, hang on, I'm a school teacher. And he said, and you'll get pregnant any day, bugger off. Now, that's very risk, it's a very risk lending practice, you've got to admit. I mean, the banks didn't have much of a bad debt problem, as you can probably imagine. And luckily for me, I went to an innovator. And the innovator I went to, the disruptor. I went to a disruptor with Vicky in 1983, and this disruptor lent us money. Now, this disruptor was a very radical organisation called St George Building Society. Believe it or not, they were a radical disruptor. It's amazing how life moves on, isn't it? Anyway, my life rolled along and I found myself researching one of the earlier unlisted property trusts called Telford Property Trust. And I found myself in Coffs Harbour uh, because they'd bought a patch of land and they had a prospectus with apartment towers on it in Coffs Harbour overlooking the water. And I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea, you know, got to be a good investment. So I wandered along and, you know, with my one year's experience uh, and I discovered relatively quickly, uh, being a diligent young man, um, I was a bit perplexed because the land had been bought for $150,000 and then sold into the trust for $4.5 million in a week. And I thought, Jesus, that's bloody escalation. How do I get part of this? Turns out, of course, it was one of the directors of the trust's personal asset. Um, then I was really perplexed because I was wandering around this rather damp paddock um, uh, purchased by the trust from one of the directors at a vast markup. Um, I had these interstate overline, overhead power lines going through it. And after talking to the electricity folk, it seemed to me that building an apartment block through these power lines wasn't going to be that brilliant a concept. Uh, Telford collapsed sometime afterwards, as you can imagine. We then rolled into an, a massive boom in the 80s in the Unlisted Property Trust, and, and here, in a sense, a bit of age is a good thing, because I had been hired from my company IPAC by Dick Dusseldorp, the chairman of Lend Lease, to, to do a bit of work over at the, as Lend Lease gained control of MLC about a million years ago. And I was over there with a guy called John Morshell, who was the, uh, the CEO of MLC and remains an outstanding Australian businessman, in my opinion, an absolutely outstanding guy. And Dick was telling me one day in the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, early part, late, late 80s, early 90s, he said, these unlisted property trusts are going to come an almighty cropper. And I said, why do you say that? And he said, a bit like I say to people today, he said, look, son, he said, I'm old and you're young, just listen for a minute. And so Dick said, look, an unlisted property trust is a vehicle that is priced by valuation. It is an unlisted asset. It's not done by the market, it's unlisted. And basically, unless your valuations are really brutal, 
The problem is you're offering basically 28 day liquidity on an unlisted asset. Now you know full well if things turn to shit, you can't get your money out and you know full well if the valuations and if the valuer is getting nearly 100% of their work from the particular company, which many of them were, higher valuations lead to higher unit pricing, which leads to better performance, which means more people flock in. And billions of dollars was flocking in, as we know, to unlisted property trusts. And then, of course, we, uh, we got to the, uh, the, the end of the 80s and we got the big credit crunch. Remember when I think Westpac shares got down to, what, about $1.30 odd? Uh, people spoke of Westpac collapsing. Um, of course, didn't happen, and I'm glad it didn't, pretty obviously. I should have bought more shares at $1.32. Anyway, um, but basically, it, you know, that was the world. And then the, uh, the, these trusts um, uh, just literally froze. Uh, and it take, took you know, an untold amount of time to unwind these things for participants. And uh, it wasn't a complete disaster for investors because a lot of the assets were actually pretty decent. Some were clearly overvalued, but a lot of money ended up leaking back. Then, of course, we got to my favourite subject matter. We now move into the later 1980s and uh, with the people like Estate Mortgage and Pyramid Building Society. Uh, this is where the money show on Channel 9 came from. Um, I was on the front page of, uh, back then it was papers, by the way, uh, saying that basically, along with a guy called Stephen Van Eyck from Van Eyck Research, uh, we were the only two people to really call these things out, and we said, these bloody things are going to collapse. They're going to collapse. Now, um, unfortunately, Stephen, uh, we, Stephen Van Eyck and myself, uh, two different companies, uh, Stephen and myself, uh, Stephen in particular, um, IPAC was a little bit bigger, so a state mortgage decided Stephen Van Eyck was a bit of a one-man band and less money, so a state mortgage unveiled an almighty court case. Uh, and I quickly learned that bad people often have more money than good people, and Steve really was worried about his house. He really was. But luckily, uh, uh, as the court case was coming closer, of course, as you recall, the state mortgage collapsed uh, with over what? Back, that, that, this, I know you're thinking this is not much money today. This is retirees' money. Back then, about $600 million, and Pyramid Building Society went fast after them. So what was the state doing? And how come a couple of people were able to pull them out? It was so bloody simple. Uh, I ended up on Four Corners and 60 Minutes with Steve uh, doing all sorts of interviews about how you got it right and the answer was, oh look, I'm, you know, look, I'm, I'm blindingly intelligent, not. And they go, come on, tell us about how, but how did you know this thing was going to collapse? And you go, well, gee, it was hard. Uh, state mortgage uh, was offering about 6% higher than any other mortgage trust in the country, about 6 And so being a very intelligent person, I went along to our major banks who had mortgage trusts to find out why they were paying 6% less. We went back to a state mortgage and said, well, but if you're paying 6% more than everyone else, we know your costs of running a business are 3%. So you've got to be lending the money at this. You know, we, we've got to see these underlying mortgages to write a decent research report if you think you're doing a great job. And a state mortgage said, oh, no, no, you can't be seeing any of our underlying documentation. That will be commercial, commercial confidence. You know, that, that's our secret. And you might remember the estate mortgage ads, which are huge TV ads. And their, their ads was designed around just like a bank or building society, only better. Now, I'm a really, really, really basic human being. And the one thing in this rapidly evolving world that is changing so much is all the brilliant stuff that's going on. Look, lower cost to consumer, better information for consumer, technology and so on is absolutely damn wonderful. But we have not and we are not going to change the fundamental tenets of risk and return. It just isn't going to happen. Again, we rolled on from a state and pyramid. Then in the 1990s, I started doing, and that, that's where the money show came from. Kerry Packer rang me up one day and said, that's pretty interesting, that stuff. That, well, you know, he actually said, that's pretty interesting, that shit you do. And um, so we started doing his money program, which was a, a raging success, which is mainly about, look, I, you know, look, I'm, I'm dead boring, all right? Do a budget, pay off your house, invest sensibly. If it looks too good to be true, it will be. If you're earning more than a term deposit, what's the catch? You know, just really basic fundamental stuff, all the stuff I see throughout, throughout my lifetime. And so I ended up uh, doing a thing on solicitors' mortgages in the mid-1900s uh, with The Money Show. And we invited along Gold Coast residents, because two in particular uh, Gold Coast law firms really dominated the solicitor first mortgage market. And the advertising was fantastic. It was first mortgage, guaranteed no more than two-thirds of valuation. And it was both true. It was a first mortgage, it was no more than two-thirds of the valuation, but the valuation was shit. So we went out and demonstrated on TV, here is a $600,000 valuation for a property which we can show is worth 100 grand. 
That was the flaw in the scheme. It was a first mortgage, it was 66%, but the valuation was a piece of shit. Over a billion dollars down the tube. We ended up with a thousand people, because we, we couldn't fit 5,000 people into a club in Tweed Heads we booked, ended up with a thousand retirees who'd lost all or most of their money in what they thought was first mortgage security. Because what does first mortgage security mean to Australians? It's your experience, it's my experience. Vicky and myself with St George's money, we buy a house, we pay a rate of interest, we pay St George back, we pay the house off, the house goes up in value. First mortgage security can't go wrong, can I? Well, as you know, bullshit, you can't go wrong. You know, you can go wrong big time. So basically, the same themes just do seem to reoccur a fair bit, and I do get, you know, just do get a little nervous. So, you know, solicitor's mortgage in Perth, a billion dollars went to broker's mortgages. Go to ASIC website, they've got any number of warnings. And I was going to the airport about a month ago. I look up behind a bus, and there's an ad on the back of the bus talking about earning 9% on a mortgage. And I thought, oh my God, where's the state mortgage back? What's going on here? And so I... Um, I went, went online, of course, being a highly sophisticated researcher, and um, you know, I just had a bit of a potter this morning. And I'm not, I'm not here to bag anyone. We're here to talk principles and, and generic concepts. It is a .com.au. Um, took me about eight seconds to find about 400 of these. Um, eight to 10% uh, per annum on your first mortgage. Uh, investment secured by a registered first mortgage over real estate. And I go, well, I, I don't understand their business model. Let, let's say I'm chasing that 10%. If, if I'm getting the 10%, I don't believe they're running a business for nothing. I doubt it's a charity. So I'm assuming there's one or 2% costs in there. So as far as I can tell, if I'm getting 10, some dill is paying 12. And I go, hmm, 12%. Looked at my adult kids' mortgages, they're paying 3.74. That's a bit less than 12. Well, hmm. Uh, once again, ring my friends in the banks, and I say, who are you lending money to at 12%? And they say, you've got to be joking, no one, we're not that stupid. It's just the same crap all over again. Well, for God's sake, you know, 8 to 10% by a registered first mortgage. Yeah, well, that's all very good and well, I want 8 to 10% on a first mortgage. What sort of dickwit is going to pay 12? Like, how stupid are we? Like, I get it with credit. I'm, look, I, look, I truly understand the model with credit. I, look, I, I know zillions of Australians with 18% credit cards. I get it. If there's 18% out there and you can intermediate and you can manage your risk correctly, as per the previous speaker, and you can say, look, we can give you maybe 10% on this, so I, I get it. I have no problem. I, look, I don't like the fact people are paying 18% and it pisses me no end. You know, one of the great things in financial literacy is stopping people doing this and bloody frequent flyer points and all the reason we do it. But the reality is it happens. So I, I get the structure. If there's 18 legitimately out there, there's sensible intermediation risk management, I get the fact that 10 may be available to me as long as credit history holds up and we don't get a recession because we all know those books turn to crap whenever the job market turns down and everyone's competing for the better parts of them. We understand all that. We, you, know, you, you people know exactly what you're doing there. But when it comes to property and I start seeing these sort of mortgages at these sort of rates, when are you going to pay 12% for a mortgage? I suspect when you've got no security, no income, and probably a crappy piece of property. So I just get really sus. And it just really bugs me that 34 years later, the same nonsense is going around in circles, and technology does not change fundamental nonsense. If it's, you know, if it's crap, it's crap. You know, if it, look, they talk about the duck, you know, the duck quacking thing. Look, my view in investment, you know, it looks like crap, smells like crap, it's crap. Now, it's a pretty simple judgment in my view. So that's kind of a pretty important to me. So anyway, the state mortgage pyramid, here we go again. So look, we're in the middle of a great evolution. It's not a revolution, but I'm not being negative here. The thing we won't change is risk equals return, and people are people. Look, I get constant streams of people when I'm on radio, whatever I'm doing. Look, retirees at the moment, what are they desperate for? They're just desperate for a bit more income. Millions of them. And when they ring me, they explain it to me in human terms. Maybe this is your parents, your auntie, your uncle, your grandparents, I don't know. But you'll have someone in your life like this. And it, it, is, it is the phone calls are, Paul, you know, if we could pick up an extra $50 a week, we could actually start going to the movies on Tuesday. We could have a coffee. We could buy a Christmas present for the grandkids. And so they want that higher return. They really want it, and they want to believe. That's why they believe Pyramid Building Society. I took a TV camera in Victoria in the late 1980s before Pyramid collapsed. As people rushed into... Um, 
another major building society down there, because I can't remember the name. They were literally queuing to get their money out of one, and they were queuing up to put their money in Pyramid, and I was walking along saying, look, with their, they had their, they had their, they had their um, building society checks in hand from the other one they'd taken the money out. And they were queuing up, and I'd go down the queue and say, but look, what are you doing? And they said, but this one, that's a building society, the one we took our money from. This is a building society, and this one pays 4% more. Hard to argue with, really, but, but, but how do they pay 4% more? Like, if they're paying 4% more, they've got to be lending it on either credit or mortgages or commercial mortgages at 4% more than the mob down the road. Surely, if people are paying, including, say, a 1% fee, if people are paying 5 or 6% more for credit so you can get 4% more, aren't you, aren't you taking huge risk? No, it's property and a building society. And we need to remember that hasn't changed. We need to be really, really, really careful about not just your credit management and your principles and so on, but gee, you've got to be careful about the people who are taking up the office. You know, you need, need to give them a bit of thought as well. So anyway, in the middle of all this is some wonderful stuff going on. I was with Greg Nedcraft down in Canberra last week talking to uh, Kelly Dwyer, who's our, 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 the Minister for both Education and Regulation. And uh, we're chuckling with Kelly because she's about to give birth. She's a lovely woman, smart girl. And uh, we're talking about um, her child and the education. She's got another child talking about her kids learning money through the education system and so on, and all the stuff, the good stuff that's going on. But Greg said, hey, Paul, look at this. And uh, for those of you who work for ASIC, you'll have been through this. Uh, Greg was being at Davos, um, and he's very excited about artificial intelligence. And so he said, you've got to see the low. Oh, God, forget. yes, Greg, show me the bloody video. And he's got this video, and he said, now, look, I'm interacting, and, and, and look at the quality of the answers. And, I, you know, you know what it's like. I said, yes, you went, we're on a, I think we're on a plane. Yeah, 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 this is great. And uh, it only took me about, about 30 seconds later, the responses were actually pretty good from this robot. But it, it took me about 30 seconds to realise it was a robot. It was um, a female. And the, the stuff that you put, some of them made, I know you're thin, but the stuff some of these geniuses around the world were doing, it took me a good 30 seconds. The only reason I worked out that I wasn't concentrating that well and it was a small phone, but the only reason that you know, I ended up picking it up after about 30 seconds was that I thought this was a, the person leading us into meeting the robot. This person was the damn robot. And seriously, 30 seconds in, it was only the, the robot, even, even, the, even the skin on the neck was moving as she was speaking. The only reason, after about 30 seconds, you know how we're very sensitive to eye movement? And after 30 seconds, she was doing a couple of her head tilts and a couple of her eye movements made me go, oh, and just looked a bit. Seriously, look, if I was 34 years younger, I would have asked to the pub for a date. Um, and really, quite, I was just, just, look, extraordinary things are going on. And uh, as you know, both in government and regulation, we're really excited about fintech because what we see in fintech, I've got my government hat on here, is we're seeing lower cost to consumers. And that's just wonderful. You know, this is, you know, if we can cut out fat margins and pass that on, that's absolutely magnificent. So what I'm saying here, and my time is just about exactly up, is that basically is that much has changed, but nothing has changed. I think in rooms of very clever people, and I'm privileged to sit in rooms of very, very clever people, far, far, far cleverer than I am ever going to be, um, but sometimes I worry that the rooms I'm in feel that, that everything is changing, yet humans, people are not changing, risk is not changing. And, and that's, I think, a, a, a genuine challenge for us. So technology, revolution, give people a better information, you know, cheaper control, cheaper access, I'm into it. Um, and I, all I'm saying is that but just, just once in a while when we're all being very, very clever, can we just remember that a whole... Two, two key things, two laws of gravity. We're doing our damn best at government policy level to improve consumer knowledge. But with every improvement we get in knowledge about money, and we've got longitudinal surveys saying it's happening, but for every improvement we get, the system gets more complicated. We're actually, we're actually net losers. Australians have never been better with money, but it's never been this hard. So final word for me is, look, let, let's just pretend, look, our cleverness is not going to mitigate risk or human behaviour, that's all. So please, intermediate, give consumers a better deal, uh, reduce margins, give access, knowledge, control, make people's lives better. You know, the day of going to the bloody stock exchange and getting a referral to see a share broker, you know, let's not do that. I'm, I'm not wanting to go back. I love, I love what is happening, but let's just remember... In all the cleverness we have in this room, we are not going to change risk and return. We are not going to change business cycles or economic cycles, be it property or credit risk. So that's my, my view. Fantastic. It's exciting. It's wonderful. But some things are not going to change.
Thank you. Oh. Um, now, just one question for you here. Um, Paul, uh, will regulation that protects consumers be extended to charities, clubs, sports and associations, particularly in reference to kind of fixed interest investments? I think Shane Warren did a great job there. Um, certainly publicised foundations. Um, look, the, the problem we have, and uh, look, I, I, I don't always agree with, with ASIC on everything, and Greg and myself have many an argument about, about some of these issues, and particularly around where does, where does regulation cut in, and, and where, where at the end of the day are we responsible for our own behaviour? You know, I, 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 know, I know around the world we're known as a nanny state, and I get it. Um, Look, I, I think with the new Charities Commission, I, I, look, I, I think there's an enormous amount of, of effort to regulate. But the smart point for me, it, we know full well, and sorry for any ASIC people who are here, but the reality is that regulation tends to follow disaster. Hmm. I don't believe regulation leads consumer behaviour. Hmm. And so the thing that you know, I would say really strongly to all, and I'm a participant as well, to all of we participants in the room, is that if we say, ah, oh, look, there's a bit of a gap in the regulation here, we can do this. Well, for me is, look, is it the right consumer behaviour? Is it the right outcome for real people? Because what will end up happening is, is that if you go back through all of my history of tales of woe, and, and generally very innocent investors getting done over. Um, look, you know, I know the papers might say, oh, you know, Paul, those thousand people you had on the Gold Coast, you know, they, they went for 3% higher than a term deposit. They were greedy bastards. They deserve to lose their money. And I said, well, no, I don't believe you because that investment product didn't say, come here to lose your money. What the front page said was security and first mortgage and 66% valuations. It, it, it said security. So I'm avoiding somewhat saying, let us rely on global regulators to always be in front of the trend. Mm. They're underfunded. They're overstretched. Mm. The government of the day will have its latest issue. So at the moment, obviously, financial advice, the banks, and mm. you know, where my company's owned by AMP, are under enormous scrutiny. Quality of it, and so they should be. Quality of advice, consumer remediation. And so, you know, the poor old regulator, and I've got a great deal of sympathy for them, because they are gross. I mean, the government's forever wanting to cut their budget. They're grossly. So do we, do we feel that the regulator should lead us into all of these areas? I can't answer what are they going to do about credit and charities and so on. The reality is I can tell you they're pretty darn stretched with the political imperatives of the day. Mm. But my view is, and this, this is a leadership group in this room, uh, unless we lead ethical behaviour and unless we self-regulate, sooner or later we will stuff it up and then we will probably get overly heavy and overly clumsy regulations to give the politicians and the public a sense of that lot of, you know, that's not going to happen again. So, I, look, really for me, it, this is exactly what these sort of forums are about. It's, it's about saying it's in all of our interest to self-regulate. And, you know, and again, it's like all these bloody ads I see. I mean, I, I take, I mean, like all of these things, I send Greg Metcraft the latest snapshot. Um, of, you know, oh my God, 10% mortgage is gone, mm. help me, here we go again. But, you know, but as ASIC say to me, but Paul, yeah, like, yeah, we, we, we've got a billion things to do. But this, just one last question. Um, if interest rates are going up in the US, yes, they are. Yes, absolutely. There's going to be a global knock-on effect and it, mm. will, it will vary. And if interest rates do go, start going up in Australia, yep. Won't that, won't that result in these stuffing up, as you quite rightly point it, which is it will, it will begin to expose those credit weaknesses and we'll see the first makings of a few scandals and then the regulators will overreact. Oh, well, we had a couple of big ones in the States in the last year and peer to peer. The, no, look, but let, let's be careful here. Now, this, this is an interesting, let me just, this comment you've made, rates go up and we see weakness. Now, the, I, I find this really fascinating. I'll try and be really quick here. I, I was really bemused as with my economics hat on as oil prices went up 10 years ago and people spoke about $100 oil, all the media were saying, as oil prices go up, the end of the world is coming. Remember that one? End of the world is coming. Then as oil prices fall over the last four years, the end of the world is coming. The end of the world is coming. Now, your comment is, <laughs> if interest rates are going up, the economy is getting stronger. Hmm. Okay? I think we need to be careful about interest rates are going up. Oh, woe is me, the end of the yeah. world. You know, you need to be careful. The, Australia, the Australian media is one of the worst in the world, for mm. example. And that is just as bad in England, by the way. I always laugh about the problems of the ageing population. The problems of the ageing population are we aren't dying. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, has anyone got a particular problem with that? <laughs> I'm 61. 
I'm clearly aware that in 1908 we have problems in government policy around funding pensions because in 1908 our forebears said, I'll pick on me, a man should get a pension when he turns 65. Very few Australians know in 1908 the reason our forebears chose 65 is that men died at 54 and 7 months. <laughs> so 11 years after you've carked it, <laughs> you get a pension to support you. And I was saying that to Corman recently. I said, look, here's a great idea for reducing the cost of pensions. Just go back to the 11-year rule. So we take life expectancy and add 11 years, which means men get a pension at 92, <laughs> women at 95. And Matthew has said, you tell them. Which is, you know, <laughs> which is a fair point, like he's elected. But see, see we say, I'm, I'm, and I'm, I'm going a long way around to picking you on a bit here, and I see this all the time, it drives me nutto. Rates rise, the end of the world is coming. Mm. Rates are rising because the world economy is in better shape than anyone can bear to imagine. Mm. Because we're, over, we're overdone in by photos of Syria on our internet, which we've never seen before. Mm. You know, a, a thing in Washington recently, I think one of these think tank things, God knows they invited me, I don't think about much of it except golf and beer. But the, um, the, you know, this guy goes, oh, you know, the Greek economy, and, you know, and, I, and it's a complete schmozzle. And I said, well, can I ask a dumb question? And he said, what? I said, when wasn't it a schmozzle? <laughs> and he went, oh, that's right. They only went broke over the first Olympics 2,000 years ago, didn't they? Look, it, it just try to make this point. So if interest rates are going up, they're not going up because the economy's weaker. Mm. What I fret about in these in credit books, and the reason I have very little of my money in credit books, I have some, by the way, I have my safe money in term deposits. Mm -hmm. They're paying me 2.65%. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I, obviously, I have different forms of credit in my book, like any sensible um, retiree, because I want to go to the movies on Tuesday night as well. So I'm not fret, I'm, I actually would fret if rates didn't go up. What I do think about if rates go up, if rates go up in a strong economy with strong employment, I remain perfectly happy. What I watch is unemployment stats. Mm -hmm. I watch the full-time, part-time stats. Yeah. And at the moment, I agree with the previous speaker, we should always be cautious. But rising rates, if unemployment suddenly blips up again, what, and let's say rates have gone up in Australia, yep. if unemployment suddenly blips up again, what happens to those rates? Yep. They go down again, right? Exactly. And we've still got a safety buffer in this country, probably bigger than most first mm -hmm. world countries. I'm far more positive about Australia than most human beings, um, and cer certainly most the media, because there's a much better headline in a failure than a success. The mm. economy is going pretty well. Unemployed, we, yes, I'd like to see a bit more full-time growth and you know, blah, blah, blah. So for me, I'll be sad if we don't see rising rates because we're right. going nowhere. What are rising rates doing to unemployment? Because unemployment is where my credit book will really get screwed yep. over. And in particular, if the, if, if, if they've been able to somehow borrow far too much money for their mortgage, yep. maybe that maybe their paperwork hasn't been quite as accurate maybe as it should 12 be. Maybe they're 12% mortgages. That would, that would fret, that would, yeah, well, that, 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 then, then I'm going to get really fretful. Yeah. But look, look, on balance, look, I'm not here to be a negative person. This, this, this evolution we're going through is fabulous for consumers. I'm just trying to alert people to the fact that we shouldn't rely on regulators to do the right thing. That I really think, though, that human behaviour has not changed. They don't understand risk. Yeah. And if we're going to say, here's a safe 10%, if anyone in this room is thinking of saying, here is a safe 10%, I just ask them that if they put their mum and dad in that safe 10%, I really want to know, are they putting their mum and dad into that product? Yeah. That, for me, is common sense. Lovely. Okay, thank you very cool. much, Paul. Thanks, folks. Very grateful. Thank you for coming. Thank you.